Oh my goodness. I think we're live. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm having quite a morning, Nick. So first of all, welcome, Nick. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> Thank you. Did you, did you do any ill-advised upgrades this morning? <sighs> all of them. <laughs> I did all of the ill-advised upgrades. Let me tell, well, so first I'll introduce myself and you, and then, and then I'll tell you about that. So hi, my name's John Galloway. I'm a PM on the .NET community team. Today we have Nick Craver, who does basically all the stuff over at Stack Overflow. What's your official, Who? what are you? I think my title is still architecture lead, um, which was given, we did a Microsoft video for build or something a long time ago, and uh, they didn't want to put developers, or engineer, DBA or whatever on the third, the lower <laughs> third at the bottom. And my boss said, you're architecture lead. And I'm like, all right, that's literally the only reason I have a, a job title. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I love the one that you've got on. Um, I think it's on Twitter where it's just lists all the things. So, well, this is amazing. Yeah. So, yesterday I was upset because going through the list, it said that I could not upgrade my desktop computer to Windows 11, and I run all the new stuff. I just that's what I do. And then last night, and, and then I got my Surface, which hasn't even been turning on for a while, but then. Hanselman told me how to manually disconnect it so that I could charge it and whatever. So I got that going, but now the battery is bulging out of the back. And so I'm like, that's usually that's, bad. That's not good. You don't want to do that too much. So, <laughs> so then last night my computer starts installing Windows 11. I'm like, no worries. I set it to reboot as soon as the update's done, but it didn't do that. So this morning I come in, I'm like, okay, it's, that's fine. I've got like way over an hour install updates, but it was like, I'm going to take a little while on this. So it did. It's chapter 19 of the Karma Guide, section six. Yes. You, can't, so, you can't do that. No. So I'm on my Mac. But the funniest thing, just to, to keep things interesting, right as we were about to start, my Mac locked up. And so I rebooted my Mac. So There were a lot of signs to not have me on. I just <laughs> want you to know you ignored all of them. And Well, I've got one final, I've got one final exciting sign, which is that when I wanted to share my screen because I do community links, mm -hmm. it said you need to restart edge in order to grant permissions to share. Oh, your to sh yeah. Mac OS changed it a little while ago. So let me see if it works though, because I think it could work. Okay. So here. Okay. So hide. I think it could add to stream. I think that Whoa, worked. Oh, streamception. Okay, so I'm going to switch over here. Now, do you see my? You see all my links, right? I'm not used to working on a on a <laughs> on, on the competitor OS. Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay, but yeah. you don't see the Streamyard anymore. You see my whole desktop, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Good. Oh, computers are so confusing. I'm going to paste over into the chat the community links. I'm going to share these links and then I'm going to quickly get off my computer before it catches on fire because that's the kind of day we're having. So here we go. Uh, first of all, uh, Khalid Abu Hakma posting about partial range HTTP requests with ASP.NET Core. Um, this is kind of neat. He talks about setting this up with static file middleware um, and the whole thing with partial range requests, like especially with serving a large file or video, that can be useful and like, I, do you do do you optimize at this level with Stack Overflow stuff? No, we, we tend to flush a page out as quickly as possible. But I totally this is where when you you're say you're streaming a video and you're streaming like a 10 second chunk or a one minute mm -hmm. chunk, chunk as people navigate the bar. That's the kind of use case, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then also you've got people that may watch part of a video and leave. And you don't need to stream the entire file to them, and that you know there's all kinds of optimization things there. So yeah, he talks through, and there's there's HTTP like this has all been in HTTP standards for a while, like all the status codes and all the things. Um, so he talks about hooking this up with uh, static file middleware, um, and here in his example, he's showing with an MP4, and then showing uh, setting that up using using the range requests in. Uh, and MVC, so nice stuff. Yeah, all right. Uh, guide to REST API versioning in AP ASP.NET Core. 
um, from Dave Brock. So there's been this thing, uh, This there's a lot of different ways you can version APIs. Uh, there's actually a NuGet package. Let's accept a bunch of cookies first. Uh, there's a NuGet package that makes it easier to do this along kind of a standard way in ASP.NET Core. So here he shows uh, adding something on to the API um, in this example, in example uh, the Eagles. And so here, uh, adding on and changing it. And then here's here's the key thing is adding on this uh, ASP.NET Core MVC versioning mm -hmm. and then turning that on in services and then being able to uh, say API request and you can set the API version. So, uh, and again, I, I just got to ask, like normally I just kind of blast through these, but like, I'm curious, do you, do you have a bunch of like backend APIs that you're working with and doing versioning stuff? Uh, so we have some APIs. They aren't typically versioned. One of the benefits, uh, these are trade-offs. Every de every decision you ever make is a trade-off, right? Spending time on something, not these kind of things. So in the back end, uh, you can either do versions or we just deploy as quickly as possible and just account for doing one back during a rolling deploy. Typically, we would always go to the latter unless you need a long-term contract. Happens mm. this morning because Collective's launched an SO. There are some new endpoints that people wanted also for communities, flagging, unflagging kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. API 2.3 released, and that is, we put it in the path. So api.sexus.com is your endpoint, slash mm -hmm. 2.3, and between 2.2 and 2.3, we do internal versioning way before any of this existed, really, so part of it's yeah. that. And uh, new um, new fields on the JSON, we don't put, even though the new type gets new fields, they only appear if you're using a later version of the API. Um, same thing for methods and all. We, we gate it behind which uh, path you're hitting. Two, okay. two, two, three. Yeah. So, like, you won't see. So, for example, on a flag, you can see if it's retracted or not. You only see that field in the JSON if you're hitting two, three, but not two, two. So, is um, that like a, a different endpoint in the API, or are you doing like if you know like conditional stuff inside of what you're returning? Or so conditional. Yeah. Every okay. request has we have an API parameters. Uh, Kevin Montrose designed most of this, and we uh -huh. just determined if you're on two, two or two, three. We put gates around the things that are supposed to be gated. Eventually, we'll get to a 3.0 API. There's talk of possibly GraphQL and all. It's a ways off, mm. though. We'll, we're starting to dive into how do we want some of that to look. OK, cool. Yeah, and this is like, there's tons of different ways you can do it. And definitely, when you're at scale or if you have existing APIs, then you're going to make different choices. What's kind of nice with this approach is if you've got like a Greenfield API and right from the beginning, you can put this in, it kind of just, you get API versioning just kind of for free, and then you just drop attributes on stuff, and, and away you go. So, so that's kind of cool. Um, this one I'm really excited about. This is cool from Steve, and he's talking about why they're using Blazor WebAssembly for their single-page application. So, people have been asking lately, like, hey, people are saying two things. They're saying, hey, Blazor's really neat. I love the tech, but I don't know if I can use it yet in production. And so, we've been trying to get examples of people that are actually using Blazor in production and just show kind of like, hey, yeah, it actually does work and it's browser standard and it's supported. Um, and so uh, here's an example, and this is this is kind of fun. This is like, you know, like pro wrestling and and Blazor WebAssembly. So that's pretty darn neat. And so they're they're just showing, you know, how how they um how they have used Blazor WebAssembly. So um, this is this is neat. And this goes back to .NET 3.1. And he talks through the different pain points involved, et cetera. So um, they have also filled out this thing, a short little advertisement. But if I go to uh, dot.net, and there's a thing here where you go customer stories. Here's another example, by the way, GE Aviation and the Postage are also using Blazor in production. But so if you scroll down to the bottom and fill out this form, submit your story, it's a little form and you go through and you just say like, here's what we're using and here's our contact info. And yes, you have your permission to email us back and whatever. And then we can get this written up and added to that page. So, so nice. pretty cool. Yeah, all right. So uh, this is an interesting one from the phrase team talking about how they, uh, how you can do 
localized error message for Blazor WebAssembly pages. Oh my goodness, all the cookies. <laughs> that needs to be a browser standard. Right, just say, <laughs> I don't care. Like I get it, it's legally required, but I love cookies. I want all the cookies, like just give me them. So I know there are extensions too. People have made like these things that just dismiss those, but. And now people are just ad blocking them. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this talks through how to hook up uh, or, or uh, localization and hook it up with your with a Blazor web form. So this is a walkthrough all the way from the beginning, uh, installing the load. Oh my gosh! So uh, installing the package. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what is what is kind of neat here though is like it's all you know pretty hooked in with the system, and you can go through and it shows actually like in the form uh, binding to culture and and um, pulling stuff from the, um, gosh, where's the one where I'm trying to show? So here they're actually creating the language resource. Uh, this is just standard ResX based and then pulling in uh, stuff from here. So it adds a little bit of noise to your thing, but of course then it's it's localized. And the phrase team, this is kind of neat. I hadn't seen this before, but this is a commercial product and they have a system for localization that kind of works across a team. So normally when I've, when I've done, you know, I've talked to people that are doing localization in the real world, they say, hey, most of the docs just show developer level localization. But in the real world, you're interacting with translators and, you know, we're sending mm -hmm. back and forth like spreadsheets or, you know, there's all these different ways. So it's, you know, like not an ad for them. I haven't tried it, but I, I like the approach of, you know, like a team based localization platform. So it's cool. All right, uh, almost done here. So uh, Blazor help website, which I believe is Michael Washington. And here he's talking through uh, creating, uh, so a lot of people ask about, you know, like how do I in modern .NET stuff, how do I do reporting? And, you know, like back in the day I was doing stuff with like SQL Server reporting services. And, you know, so Power BI is definitely a pretty powerful way to do reporting in modern .NET. Or, or anything, because you can just embed it. So here he walks through embedding that and also including edit forms and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the thing that he does in his blog posts is he does not mess around. He gives tons of screenshots. So look over here at the scroll bar. I'm not gonna go through all this, but this is in depth and annotated screenshots, all the code. So, um, you know, we do have people ask about reporting and this seems like a pretty pretty good solid way to do that. All right, last one I wanna talk about before I turn the floor over to you. So this is your running series of posts on the tech stack, how you do tech at Stack Overflow. Walking series, 2020 was a low um, <laughs> motivational period, I think for a lot of people. Me, I but, hear you, man. Yeah. <laughs> we all get a buy for that year. Um, <laughs> But I love this that, you know, like you can go back through and you can see the evolution. You can see like, here's some things we're working through. Um, and you you talk about like app caching, monitoring, deployment. Um, and this is like the real world stuff. So, I mean, yeah, I just, I thought, you know, we'll talk through and you mentioned some of this stuff is still how you're doing things now. So if people want to see yeah. like the actual write up of how you implement it and how you do this stuff, here it all is. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll turn the floor over to you. Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> so I already see some, I see I see questions in chat and everything. I guess uh, we talked about some of the stuff earlier, uh, if we wanted to go through some things that might surprise people about Stack Overflow. Um, mm -hmm. Let me give an overview real quick. Uh, if you look at how we handle things, we have nine web servers. We've got a load balancer in front. Uh, there's two different ones for DDoS and things. But basically, we handle roughly eight to ten billion hits a month across those, and then the web tier is getting you know five or six thousand requests per second. That's that's not humongous. Other people do more. What we tend to do is do it very efficiently. We do that on very little hardware. We can still run on one server if we want to. Um, right. The web tier right now is running at about. Uh, let me pull this up. Currently, the web tier is sitting at one to five percent CPU, and this is about peak traffic for the day. Um, peaks about an hour ago when the West Coast wakes up, typically. So, .NET Core is extremely efficient. Um, .NET was already efficient if you're following basic principles, right? Do things as simple as you can. 
don't do what you don't need to do. Um, don't cash what you don't need to cash, that kind of stuff, right? Um, I thought one neat exercise would be going through the question page. Um, do you want to share from your sure. side? Just pick a random Stack Overflow question. Well, or, it's also, it's very easy to share from your side if you want. If you yeah, want you know what? Try. I'm going to have many profilers. So let me share. Let's get Stack Overflow up and then I'll invoke Okay, the so there's here. a share screen thing at the bottom and then I'll pop it on the screen when we're ready. Yep, let me just grab something with a couple of answers so that we see something. And I'm partly saying this because my computer may explode at any second. We don't even know what's going on. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna get something with quite a bit of data in it, um, which, will, which will show a much larger load time than most people would see. Um, I know I want to share my screen. Come on. All right. So window, <laughs> let's see this. So here's a random Java question on Stack Overflow. Um, what I think, a, what a lot of people tend to assume is that we cache a lot or we go into things. Now you'll see the load time for this question is extremely heavy because there are tons of answers. There are 33 answers. There's moderator stuff. This is an abnormally high page load at 200 hey, milliseconds. Is it possible to zoom on that um, a bit? Uh, I can just make the window smaller. Yeah, there you go. There we go. That better. Um, yeah. And then if I go to a small question page, we'll just grab some random new question asked a minute ago. You'll see that the, the load time, even with me with moderator, is 43 milliseconds. Uh, and a lot of this is viewing uh, things that a normal user wouldn't see. So the average render time for a question in and out the door is about six milliseconds. Um, and that's up to like 90th percentile or so through our infrastructure. So you're coming in, you're coming out. Um, and I'll show a dashboard in a little bit, which illustrates this of how few concurrent requests are streaming through. Uh, but if you look at this page, you know most people would assume like, you know, we cache the question or we cache the sidebar and this kind of stuff. And that's mm -hmm. not really the case. So let's look at it on a simple example. This is mini profiler. And you can see all of the things that are happening to render this page. Okay. Can you can you share it like there's a, a dedicated page for a mini profiler, right? Because some people mm -hmm. are com completely new to that. It, aware it won't be dark mode. Ah, oh guys. my goodness. I know I should fix that. Uh, so anyway, well, it actually mini profiler is CSS3 themed, by the way. So you can just set theme variables. So we oh, match cool. it to our theme. We don't actually mini profiler is not matched to Stack Overflow. We just override a few variables to our Stack Overflow dark settings or light settings. Okay. Um, so uh, by the way, Trick, you don't have to log into Stack Overflow to do this. If you go to your um, page here, it's just a class. <laughs> you can do this oh, wow. extension or whatever, but this is all CSS variables. Um, uh, Aaron, our designer, Aaron Chicky is doing a beautiful job of this. Uh, so anyway, on the question page, you see this Redis column. You don't need to look exactly, but you see I'm hitting Redis one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times in Redis. Again, some, or actually, sorry, there's more in there because uh, one of these is a multi-hit, right? The body, these are uh, moderator functions that a user, normal user won't hit. And if I hover over down here, I don't know if you see tool tips, but that's 14 Redis calls, okay? And then SQL, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 SQL calls in mm -hmm. that page. And then one out to a, um, a private API on the back end, which is HTTP. And still, even with all that moderator stuff, this is 40 milliseconds. Um, typically, a web page is way down in the six millisecond range because we just get you in and out the door fast. And all of that typically works. However, that's a trade-off, huge trade-off decision, right? Uh, Mark Gravel has a great way of explaining this that I was referred to, which is if you build a small hallway it's a great thing to just have everyone sprinting down the hallway. I don't have to build a lot. It's a great pipeline. It goes fast until mm -hmm. someone trips. <laughs> then, oh, you're, right. then, you're, then you're boned, right? Um, yeah. So what happens there is uh, if you think about flows of, you know, if you take Fowler or Damien talking about this, you hear back pressure. Uh, and the reason back pressure exists is because at the head end of something, if you go kaboom, then everything beyond it that has some sort of capacity limit starts being exhausted, right? So mm -hmm. if we query SQL and it's slow, then the connection pool to SQL, which we only allow 150 per app pool on the server, then that gets exhausted. And then when that gets exhausted, then we have threads waiting to get a connection from the pool. Then you start exhausting your thread pool. So and things really happens, stack up then. It's so like one, a freeway pileup, basically. Yeah, one slow request or one slow query turns into affecting everybody. Well, right? you'd have to have several hundred slow at the same time. Um, okay. But at our scale, I mean, if you're getting 
per web server, three to 500 requests per second all day long, mm -hmm. it only takes a half second of stall to quickly exhaust, exhaust all those resources. So okay. our infrastructure and our approach to this point depends very much on being fast. So, you know, when someone says, can you run this in Azure? Can you run this in AWS? Um, we don't know because the, the dynamics of latency and things are very different. Um, some people at Stack Overflow would just take a shot every time I say latency, but it is tremendously <laughs> important. Um, yeah. Our average latency is 0 0.014 milliseconds between who we need nodes on the network because we're just one switch and back for everything, right? right? We just have a couple of servers. Um, so anyway, running all of this stuff, what it's meant to illustrate is if you look at this page, we are fetching the question, the tag, the question body of tags that comes from a thing. The votes all come from a thing. And remember, we have to check, did you vote? Because if I have an up arrow on here, it is going to be orange when I go back, right? So there's a query for those if you're logged in. We don't run that if you're logged out. Uh, any comments are fetched automatically. Um, the sidebar, this related and these related are fetched. The only things cached on this page really are your this community sidebar here because it doesn't change, but once an hour roughly, and then mm -hmm. hot network questions. That's all that's cached on this page. Everything else is coming live. All of these indicators up top, your info, the your inbox, all of this stuff is queried when we load the page. Okay. Why? And you have to look at your app dynamics, right? Like how is your data accessed? One mm -hmm. of the things we looked at, so Mark Gravel and I worked on a caching solution where we looked at the cache and, and if you use memory cache, it's got this interface for uh, memory cache entities and things, and they're heavy. They have callbacks. They have mm -hmm. when you expire, run this code, that kind of stuff. So what we do is we don't have uh, a need for any of that. So an object, when you put it in cache, we found like caching like a two byte string or an integer was eating like 80 to 96 bytes of refs <laughs> we don't need just because of right. how large the object was. So we trimmed all that out. We made it a fourth the size and we got back to about a third of the size, I think. And now we also track how often it's used because we had a theory. And my theory was this sidebar, last time we looked, Jason Pine is gonna kill me for saying this out loud, but Last time we looked, which has been a while, about 75, 80% of the questions get accessed every two weeks. It's a very long tail. The wow. longer tail, the less likely a cache for like five minutes is ever going to be used, right? Right. So, 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 yeah, this goes to like, there's some, there's some sites where there's pages that get hit a lot, right? Like, I don't know, let's say mm -hmm. you're a, a concert website and everyone wants to know when the concert is and whatever that page, you can cache the heck out of it, right? But right. then, the, as you're saying here, people will browse to one page in the site, either like the answer or not, they'll click away and they're not gonna come back to it. That or, or uh, it, it could be a, a very esoteric thing that is very little access, it could be a crawler coming through mm. and accessing these things. Um, and these are surface areas for crawlers to go through, right? In our case, no. it's uh, caching on how do I undo a git commit <laughs> would be very advantageous. <laughs> but not oh, well, in that. So do you, I mean, so you just disproved the question I'm going to ask, but are <laughs> there some pages that are, or answers that are asked so many times, or, you know, are there like a threshold of a certain mm -hmm. amount of pages where it's like, it's worth caching those pages? We could look at view count and cache based on that. We don't vary at the moment. The first step okay. was what we saw was these related questions and there's also linked questions. Uh, these are generated very differently. This is generated off Elasticsearch. We take the body and title and tags of a thing and then we look at similar things. In linked, it's literally any question, answer, comment has a link to a different thing on Stacker Overflow in either direction and it appears on linked. Those are the two okay. things. So we were caching this HTML in local cache and in Redis sometimes. And what we found was that 99.99% of the time it was not used. It had a cache access count of zero. And this is why we went through and implemented our own cache layer. We could have a counter of how many times it's actually fetched from cache. And we could just take a snapshot at any given time or just run a method and iterate on it and see how many patterns of keys were just not getting used. So we lowered our cache usage by about 40% by not caching the sidebar. And the pages load faster because we were spending time, A, getting the data, which still happens, B, mm -hmm. allocating the string. Remember the whole string. This is a very big difference between .NET Core and .NET. .NET buffers the whole response. So you were mm -hmm. using shared memory buffers to write some strings and then funnel them out the pipe. Um, there's yeah. good and bad to that. And then in .NET Core, you're just streaming out the response. 
So if you're just taking data and you're in a view, a razor view, and you're just looping through, in .NET Core, you're just writing to the output stream. I'm not allocating or realizing mm. the whole HTML from here to here, which is you know a couple of K or something, depending on the pet question, right? So you're allocating that string, you're sticking it in memory. And remember, we get a lot of requests per second, right? So we get garbage collections kind of constantly. And although we allocate little, there's still some happening because you trade off how much time you want to invest in that, right? Yeah. So when you're when you're doing collections constantly, those strings are going from Gen 0, where you're allocated to .NET, up to Gen 1, up to Gen 2, which is collected a lot more rarely because it's in cache five minutes. But within five minutes, it easily has two generations go by, right? Okay. So garbage, so L2 usage went down about 60%. Um, Gen 2 usage, and we're not spending time GCing it. The GC was crawling all that as well, right, to go over. Okay. And that kind Wait. of stuff, yeah, big impact. So we're getting some questions. So this is this is great. We're Shoot. getting some questions come in. So one is like, just what's the overall? You mentioned, you know, like it's just a few servers. Is it? Is there? Do you have like a, a diagram, or is there anything that shows kind of the overall what the architecture looks like? Yeah, so if we go to one of those posts, which is not too far back because I suck at posting, um, it roughly, this image is probably the clearest um, picture. I'll make this a little taller. So you're coming in from, we use Fastly as our uh, front end for most things. And there's a couple of reasons for that. People think DDoS uh, and people think Fastly and Cloudflare is CDNs. Now that's evolved. And they're really, um, when you're optimizing a website, you're not optimizing mm -hmm. how much time it takes to render the page. That is just the wrong target. You want to be optimizing uh, how fast a page feels for a user. I don't have it anymore. We, we used to use a Grafana. We've migrated monitoring systems now, but I used to have a map of how long a page load took all over the world and mm -hmm. how long each step took, right? When you connect a website, you've got to negotiate SSL uh, the first time per session. You've got to go ask for the data, get some back. And the way TCP works is, I say, give me data. And if you're, you have a large amount of headers, tons of cookies and all, that might be two round trips. That's bad the further away you are, right? Um, and then you act it. And when it says, you, you send the client some data, it's called TCP slow start for anyone curious about this. So you're sending data down, uh, like 10 packets, usually a 1400 byte MTU packet. And then you say, I got that. And then you act it back. And the server goes, all right, here's twice as many. You act it back. Here's twice as many. It's generally an exponential ramp up there's some tweaks around this, but it's generally doubling until you send so much data and the client goes, nope, I'm missing one. Or you're just uh, finished. You finish the request. That's packet loss. People think packet loss is universally bad. Packet loss is how the internet doesn't fall over. Because if you were just, to, if everyone just said like data and just like threw a gig at you, routers would just run out of buffers and fall over. So slow start ramps up things. Now, okay. that slow start, negotiation is between you and what you're connecting to. If that's New York, uh, in our case, we're actually in New Jersey. It's a touchy subject, but um, we, the, sorry, we moved and no one wanted to rename all the surfers. So they're in Y, but we're in Jersey. <laughs> so if you're acting back and forth, you want that to be a very low latency thing. And so you want to connect to Fastly or Cloudflare or somebody and back really quickly. And that's why I have CDNs all over the world for static files. Same is true for dynamic. Uh, and then they have a connection open to us, which is more persistent, and they have already ramped up their slow start. So we can just go like question, full page back, and then they can stream it to you out of their buffers, even if you're ramped up slowly. So that's the other reason to have a CDN or an edge node close to a person is because that slow start for you is fast instead of all the way around the world. So from Australia, for example, this can take a 400 millisecond page load with multiple acts back and forth down to... 30 milliseconds or something, How long, long it takes to send back the actual, just one round trip from Sydney to New York, basically. Okay. Um, back and back. Um, so those kind of things make it to where you want to stream out in those kind of bits. Do uh, Does HTTP2 or 3 change that much? HTTP2 allows you to multiplex your connections in. You can actually connect to Fastly one time and one ramp up as well. So each mm. TCP... Uh, slow start ramp up is per connection. Um, I'm actually not 100% sure how this works because theoretically you're ramping up both connections at once. 
But if you're doing it very quickly over HTTP2, you should be ramping up exponentially at roughly the same rate, but you miss the initial window of doubling. So mathematically, okay. it would be one latency order off, I believe, but you're also able to request all your resources at once. Uh, HTTP2 used to have push and everything like, here's the web page and here's the images you're going to need. That's pretty much a crap show. Like it doesn't really work. <laughs> all the browsers <laughs> like kind of got bored and stopped. Um, plus yeah. you're like, I want to send you all the images and I don't know if you have them yet by the time you ask for the web page. That requires a round trip. So to be fast, I need to blindly always send them to you. And okay. that's tremendously inefficient and I'm paying for bandwidth. So basically no one really adopted it and it kind of fizzled out. And I don't know of anyone that I talk to that actually uses push. But HP2, you can get all your responses back in one stream and you're mm -hmm. already you know raised up very high on your your connection, your TCP window of how many bytes you can send at a time for that doubling we talked about. Okay, so you've talked about caching and the transport. What about browser caching? Because my, my like, mm -hmm. whatever civilian way of hearing this is like, <laughs> first of all, everyone's like, hey, you know, browser caching is great. And then after a while, people started saying nothing's actually cached. Browsers don't actually cache anything. It's a waste of time. It seems like, and, and then I get like, I don't, I've played a little with Cloudflare, but like that edge, you can also potentially like, it'll cache things at the edge for you too, like images and static stuff. Mm -hmm. And so how, how, how does browser and edge caching work for you for static resources? So it's, uh, it, it gets, there's a lot of details to it. Um, a lot of people think of browsers as you, uh, so for example, the old day, you tried to connect and the old advice like 10, 12 years ago was mm -hmm. you need to have a CDN domain. And the reason for the CDN domain originally was Internet Explorer 6 at the time would only mm -hmm. connect so many connections oh, yeah. to, to one domain. And so you split it to paralyze your connections. That was the original reason CDN's kind, CDN domains popped up. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, hey, that limit's gone. It's like 10 or higher. It's it's way up there because the internet got better and they made new computers, which don't sell one is 11. Um, <laughs> so now you've got all of these things going back and forth um, to one domain or two. But very recently, this has become a possibly worse, depending on your model. Okay, for us, it's worse. Stack Exchange has multiple sites. Um, and we have bicycles.stackexchange and Stack Overflow. If you go to those two things, you will actually be hitting the same app pool. We run all 400 websites inside of one app pool. And it's wow. using right now 4% CPU. It's just <laughs> ridiculously <laughs> e efficient. And I, I'll happily brag about that because it's awesome. .NET, if you know how to use it, it's fantastic. So when you're um, doing those two, we have cdn.sstatic.net, which is what you would think. It's our static content domain, right? Mm -hmm. It used to be that if you visited Bicycles and if you visited Stack Overflow and they both loaded like main.javascript, right? Main.js off the CDN domain, you would already have it cached when you visited the second one, right? That's gone. Browsers have yeah. very recently in the past couple months, oh, the origin right. domain, they separate it. So now we get no benefit out of that shared thing because the browser treats it as uncached. So but that's now, that's That's... Oh, okay. I think I can answer my own question. But originally they had all this stuff with like, it included a SHA hash so you could verify the resource. And mm -hmm. so I would think, hey, that's fine. I'm not going to worry about like tampering or whatever, but you still get fingerprinting, I guess is the concern, right? So uh, Yes. How quickly do you load the page? People do timers and things. Yeah. And they would based on that. Now, if you look at the navigation performance timings, which when I said, remember I said earlier, I have a graph. Used mm -hmm. to have a pretty map rest in peace, of all over the world how long something took. We actually have metrics still flowing in from 5% of requests for all Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange users. We send metrics up. And you can actually see this. Um, if you go to teststackoverflow.com, hmm. um, you'll actually, this is just because we do this in secret, but it's not very secret. Every <laughs> once in a while, we want to test something. We want to test a new DNS provider, or we want to test um, some fundamental network connection. What we will do is we'll embed this test stack overflow as an iframe down in the page. We haven't actually done this in years, but when we were evaluating Cloudflare, move to Fastly, or evaluating more DNS providers. What we wanted to see is these DNS lookups, depending on which provider tests we were running. So we collect this these metrics, they're just numbers from mm -hmm. 
5% of requests to Stack Airflow. So we can see all over the world uh, and it records with country. And we, we are very, you know, full disclosure, here's exactly what we send up, right? Um, and so it's we, just timing data. It's just Depends timing on. data. Now, importantly, if you are not on the same domain, this is kind of like cores esque. If you're not on the same domain, these uh, start times and everything will be, I forget exactly which metrics, but they'll be zero. You, you are not allowed to tell in the page uh, because for example, the attack vector is I load evilbank.com or mm -hmm. goodbank.com, whatever, bank.com's JavaScript in my page. And then I just see, did it take zero milliseconds? That probably means you're a member of that bank. This is what they're trying to prevent based yeah. on load timings. Were you already there? Fingerprinting. It is fingerprinting. Mm -hmm. um, and so the DNA, the domain splitting is an evolution of that. I'm not sure exactly which thing that's mitigating, but it's these are the kind of attack vectors people are trying yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, you can say like if these following libraries are loaded or whatever, you can like narrow down to a specific individual and, and, mm -hmm target them for ads or, or, you know, evil malware or whatever. So, yeah. And if you, so you see this page, right? I've now, now I've cached fave icon and stuff. So if I just mm -hmm. load this in another tab where I've got it cached, then you'll see down here that like domain lookup oh. went to zero and yeah. now I've already cached this file. So my, my telemetry went to 115 milliseconds versus my first hit was 426 from these negotiations. So secure connection start, this was me negotiating TLS. Um, and there's a lot of factors in this, right? TLS is its own rabbit hole of uh, there's fast start and these kind of things. And we enable all of that. Mostly Fastly handles this between you and us. And we mm -hmm. go with largely their default configs. They're experts at this. There's no reason for us to be core competency between yeah. past our connection to them, right? Um, well, and then you, you yeah. my understanding is you can basically treat the world is all supporting HTTP2 and the other stuff and Fastly kind of negotiate some of that stuff on mm -hmm. the edge then? They'll translate between. And in the Fastly logs that come into our side, we can see which cipher suites are used and all. There's all right. different detections and things you can do on that. I'm, I'm not going to get into to DDoS mitigations because they're... Yeah, you don't. <laughs> they're, they're not public always. Yeah. And they're not they're not necessarily ours. And they didn't some of them didn't come from us, but there are great ideas about how to analyze some stuff out there. Um all for all for good. We get we get smacked with botnets a lot. I mean uh, it's yeah, a bet. weekly occurrence. People try and knock us well, off. So I mean some's malicious, but I'm sure some people just like the same way Google probably gets hit with a million like tests, do I have an internet <laughs> connection? Go ping Google or ping stack. You know, it's like there People was just a, want to ping a domain to see if if they have connection or something. Okay, so I have two quick stories about that. One is when we <laughs> went to HTTPS, our homepage traffic dropped by it was like ninety four or ninety eight percent because we we were we were about to like based on traffic levels do some homepage things. Um, so people were wondering like, why is there a, a thing on the homepage? Don't a lot of people use it? No, they don't. The homepage is not visited by users that oh, much. Right. And what we figured out was when we move to HTTP to HTTPS, we give you a 301 if you're on HTTP. And the most of our traffic goes from D-Link or DDWRT routers who were oh. using us as a health check. And they didn't they didn't give a crap about the 301. They right. just didn't take the second request. So yeah. in terms of actual page loads, our traffic dropped by like 94 some percent when <laughs> I deployed HTTPS. And there's a big blog post about all that stuff. And the other is, um, when when we're doing nope i forgot it okay well that's <laughs> fine because we've got some questions coming in on Still and it. i'm just i'm just dragging you all over the place asking random questions so if you want to keep going on something that's fine but there there's some some questions about how you're doing data for instance like do you have a one database to do read and write and do you have like different levels of database or or etc um, so there's a couple of things going on here. This is largely the setup, right? You come in, switches, load balancer, yada, yada, yada. Um, mm -hmm. When you go into .NET here, you're on the web server and you're talking to database, Elastic, Redis. Um, our three data stores, basically, SQL is the source of truth. Redis can be completely nuked and it will restart and get fully populated Elastic same way. We Elastic index from SQL on a job. Um, we have a scheduler and things. Dean Ward's in chat right now. He can answer you questions about scheduler if you're curious. We have a, it runs over here and it's multi-tenant and resilient, use Redis locks and all. And then Redis is caching. It is not transparent. We read from SQL right in. 
now there's two main SQL nodes. Sorry, each cluster, these are there are two clusters for SQL. One is Stack Overflow and what's called the Sites database. Mm-hmm. If you're curious, we're as bad at naming as everyone else is. <laughs> um, and in the Sites database, we have all of the, the top level stuff of the network, your account, your um, inbox, the, the things that are global, right? And yeah. those two have grown at about the rate of literally everything else. Um, from talent to the rest of the network, hundreds of databases are on the su- second cluster, right? How, how big are we talking like database size, like multiple gigabytes or, or like are things sharded um, out like crazy? Or Stack Overflow is about five terabytes. Um, and this is another question that okay. comes up, like, could you run <laughs> could you run on a cloud? Well, we're that at the point that and, yeah. some stuff breaks, right? And yeah. managed options are few, that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. uh, in each each database uh, cluster, there is a primary, and we use always on availability groups in SQL Server. It automates your replication for you. The way all replication works for databases in pretty much 99% of databases is you send a full copy down, and then you replicate your changes. That's basically how they all work, right? Redis works that mm-hmm. way. SQL works that way. Whether Redis is a database is a flame where I'm not going to get into. <laughs> um, <laughs> pick, your, pick your side. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, but SQL, we read from the primary for almost everything. And like on the main question page here, when you see all of this down here, we don't want to take the time to open up a connection to the secondary. So all question pages come directly from the primary. Okay. But if mm-hmm. we're doing something like... Uh, granting badges or um, running API queries, things that do not matter if you're a second or two different on data. Typically, the the secondary is within a couple seconds, uh, usually under a second of latency to the main primary. Um, So for example, we do some tricks, right? If you're on the API and you do a write, we will temporarily forward your request to the primary to make sure you saw what you just put in just in case uh, SQL's right. behind. And this is yeah. what other people do around the world. If they have a, a multi-national setup, like they've got a rep. So for example, we had a theory a long time ago. What if we put a node in Europe? And we, we spec this out. We just didn't have money at the time to do it. Um, mm-hmm. We figured we could put a 2U box in Europe and make latency over there go down by half for all wow. pages. And yeah. it would be a SQL replica. And if you wrote, we would just forge you back to the main data center and make you slower for a couple seconds before sending you back. A lot of people do this. I think even GitHub may do this under the covers. Um, not a not a novel trick. Which um, makes sense from, a, from the workflow. Okay, so because if I submit something, I need to see it live to make sure it went live, but nobody else in the world cares if, yeah. if it doesn't go live for a second or two. They're not relative <laughs> to you. And all the DBAs yeah. that are watching this are gonna scream, but we use read uncommitted for the same reason. It doesn't matter that you're plus or minus a dirty read. It doesn't matter. It's like you loaded the page a second later or a second earlier. Right. Who yeah. cares? We're not a bank. If we were a bank, yeah. you'd have you design for your constraints as best you mm-hmm. can. Try not to back into a corner. And if you need to change, you change. And we try and approach things as simple as possible with everything we do. Has been the general rule. Um, and there there are trade offs to that, right? Make it complex when you need to make it complex, but mm-hmm. not until then. That's just people over design early a lot. I think. Like you said, you're not a bank, so there's like different harms for things going wrong. And in your case, if somebody reads something that's not the absolute latest version, it's like, that's okay. Like, or what, or it's a balance of like, what's the harm versus like, how does it affect your entire like operations otherwise? Yeah. If you, a lot of this may resonate with, resonate with people. If you take a, um, uh, take an example of I'm upvoting someone's stack overflow. I want to upvote them and accept their answer. We use mm-hmm. an ORM to do this. So we use the entity framework and we use Dapper. We use both. Don't. This was my next, que- next question. Yeah. Can you okay. talk about that? Cause so, I, I like, it's got, it's, it's keyed down a bit over the past few years, but there's always been this like, ah, you know, like angst over what, what you use for data. So, how do you choose what to use for, for each? Generally, EF core for inserts or where we might do a data mutation later. Like we, we do optimize compile queries for um, like post.git or user.git. Though with compiled, they're pretty much on par. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for anything else that's reading or we want to put an option in there or any kind of sophisticated SQL with cross join out or applies, whatever, though that's dapper. Most things are dapper. EF core for where you don't need to build a big tree of objects and insert them in the right orders and get the keys. And EF core does a great job of that. It's fine. Um, So EF core is the whole like ORM, whereas Dapper, like, and like you said, it tracks keys and it allows for updates and allows for 
all the whereas Dapper is a lot better at just like shaping data to display on a screen, right? Yeah, like it's get a query it, it, exactly. Yeah. So we use both. Um, and when Dapper is used on the back end, we can again we can query either database. We have current.db, which is our live database, or current.readonly db. And we can encode just determine which one you you fall back and forth to, right? The whole reason we created Dapper was linked to SQL at our scale mm -hmm. was slow. We encountered some locking internally that just wasn't hit before anyone before. Right. We, we pump a lot of traffic through little hardware. We are by no means the biggest website. Like people pump way more traffic than we do. They don't generally do the ratio of traffic to servers that we have. And that yields some interesting problems. And for a long time that was, but we just built for the constraints, the budgets that we had, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. There's another thing. Da, da, da. Oh, so I don't know. Do you want to talk any more about it? There, there's a question how often you deploy. Yeah, let's get to this. The, the EF yeah. core team invited Mark and I on to a stand up. So I would say if we want to go deep dive on that, well, we haven't picked a time yet. I was supposed to ask Martin this morning and I'm yeah. terrible. So that didn't happen. But we'll we'll set up on the EF core stand up. People that, really sounds great that sounds really um, good. Yeah. Deploy, uh, I think we've deployed four times today so far. Uh, some days it's zero just because it's quiet, and some days it's 20. It's, um, it just varies a little bit. Uh, yeah. We can build right now about, it takes about 15 minutes to go all the way to Pry. There's there's a little bit of slowness been introduced. But sometimes, um, and Dean's answering questions in the chat there too, which is mm -hmm. great. We're, uh, we now have a dedicated team. Since we got... Um, we got bought recently, right? Which yeah. includes funding and, yeah, cool. um, and you know, they're largely just leaving us alone. Uh, <laughs> we can, I know of no, nothing that's not being left alone. Uh, you know, it's then, funny people, people, people worry about like, like, some, and I, I get it. Sometimes a company will buy another company and then make a bunch of changes. But I've seen like too with Microsoft, like, People freaked out when Microsoft buy GitHub, and it's like I've just seen the more features come out. Like it yeah. kind of seems okay, you know. So, so, yeah. so in our case, that that issues more uh, funding sooner to mm -hmm. some hiring we want to do. Um, so there are jobs right now. If you go to, if anyone's curious watching this, and you're because a lot of people have at, I got I went through DMs last night because I found out. Um, or hid a lot of them from me in TweetDeck. There's <laughs> Stack Overflow slash work here. Literally in any pattern, we four of 302 them all uh okay. but you can you can see jobs and things so one of the teams we're doing and samo's in chat there too samo and max are specifically working on build tooling we've never had the resources to just concentrate on that so we're moving to github actions we're still looking mm -hmm. at how we do packages and deploys and stuff there's some limits and authentication and it's young there's we're hitting some edges and the, the team over there stuff chris patterson's been awesome to work with he's just oh, cool. magnificent yeah. doing that um so we're moving to GitHub Actions off of Team City, which means we can deploy and build a lot faster when we finish that process. It's just a lot of moving pieces to yeah. to get over there. Yeah. Um, so deploy many times a day. Um, at the moment, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like long term. Probably we create a container image or a zip file, probably both. So most people don't know this. We deploy in multiple environments. So Stack Overflow, the one code base, um, we deploy an enterprise mode or not. We compile an enterprise mode because the security models are different. If you're an oh, enterprise, right. yeah. So if you think about Stack Overflow, uh, channels is what we call the back end of Teams. I recommend this. People may disagree with me. It's fine. Uh, don't chase your product names. I think it's just, <laughs> you're just in for a bad time. Um, some things, like I've seen some clients do this and they have the code name of every single thing they've ever released in the thing eventually. Mm -hmm. We call the back end channels. And whatever the front end team, front end's called Teams right now, is separate. We only reskin the surface if marketing ever chases a new name. This just happens with companies right. and products. So we keep calendar channels. Not we named all the servers and everything. So um, we compile different modes, but basically the same code base almost entirely runs an enterprise, which is a hosted version we have for. It's your private area. You are very high availability. That kind of stuff private in Azure. We have it where you can host it in your own environment for customers who are very strict. Um, and then we run it in channels like we have today, Teams, um, and then Stack Overflow proper. So that same code base has to scale very different levels. Um, and sometimes that's interesting in and of itself, right? Do I want people are like, do you do microservices? What would a microservice architecture look like if a customer mm -hmm. is running this on-prem? 
right? If you're totally hosted and you only have this one thing going on, then you can design heavily for that. In our yeah. case, we've actually got this constraint of design that a lot of people aren't fully aware of, that there are multiple stack exchange sites and multiple scales of them. It okay. yields some interesting fun. Yeah, yeah. That, so like you're saying, the build process has to be able to build like zip file release or whatever, like different sorts of ways that other people can do these installs, right? Right. So right now we, we're running production on an IIS web tier because it's it's fine. It runs great. Uh, and all we do when we deploy, we don't use any of the deploy shenanigans. We just stop the thing in the load balancer. We stop the website in IIS, robocopy, start, start. That's mm -hmm. it. That's the entire deploy. And we just loop through the web tier doing that. Um, in Azure or in AWS or any cloud you went to, as well as a customer, th there are people who make products, uh, virtual appliances. You give them your containers and they wrap it. That's mm. something we're investigating. I don't want to build an appliance. That's not where I want to spend my time or most people. If you like right. to do that, knock yourself out. That's not anything people are interested in where <laughs> I'm at. So if we could do containers, you can have a container that can deploy in Azure, can deploy in AWS, can deploy inside this appliance. But then what does production look like, right? Um, production for us is a drastically different scale than any of these other environments. Th like a thousand times, literally the request per second, um, a thousand to a hundred thousand times more data, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I need tooling that you can debug. And .NET is advancing a lot, but the Windows tooling is still more mature. It had a 20 year head start, right? So profilers, memory debuggers, this kind of stuff is still better on Windows at the moment. Um, so we don't know how we're going to debug if we were deployed Stack Overflow Prod on Container and on Linux. We don't know. We've got to do some discovery. And that's where Max and Samo especially are working on that kind of stuff. They're the yeah. tooling team. Yeah. I'd be curious your thoughts if you your team look at um, Project Thai because some of that makes it a little easier to do microservice .NET with integrated debugging and, and stuff. But. Um, so Dean's looked at this a little bit. We used, uh, we do use Yarp for um, this MacBook right here. We'll run Stack Overflow on it. Um, wow, that's cool. <laughs> If so, it'll not sleep Yarp for, for people that don't know, Yarp is a .NET based uh, reverse proxy and handles all like, so you can, I worked with somebody recently on my team that was moving a domain somewhere else and talking about like they were concerned with, they thought they would need to write 20,000 different redirection rules. And I was like, you could mm -hmm. possibly do that. Turned out they didn't need to, but you could do something like that using Yarp because you can write code based redirection and stuff. And so. yeah, that's the thing. So we run in proc and IS, if anyone's curious, you can run out of proc and in proc. There's a mm -hmm. uh, inner process communication, which is roughly four times slower last I looked. So we run in proc. That may have gotten better in five and six. That'd be a mm -hmm. foul question. Um, but IS starts your app. It has some restart mechanics. It has a few niceties in the meta of a process that we still lead on. Um, and also we do host header sharing, right? We are neighbors with other processes. So mm -hmm. Um, we have like talent.stackoverflow.com is a different app pool. So we redirect to that and then Stack Overflow. Remember, all 400 some websites hit this app pool. Everything that doesn't match another app pool goes to the star, which is the Q&A application. Because when we launch a new site, right? Like we launch a new Stack Exchange site, you don't want to go edit config 19 blazes. So it is the wildcard fall through, DNS, IS, everything. And on a MacBook or in Linux, if you're going to do something similar for a dev environment, you uh, need something to simulate what IS does. That's Yarp. Yeah. And Dean Ward built all that. He can answer tons of questions. The, the oh, experience cool. we're finding on a Mac right now is just that you don't have the event log in things. So when stuff goes sideways, it's not as easy to figure out for non-devs. And that's a point of friction with designers and stuff. It's getting better every day. But mm. for now, we're looking towards like code spaces for oh, designers. Right, right. Get it running there, which is an even less time consuming experience, right? Okay. Yeah. So you called out, people are answering questions in the chat, which is awesome. So thanks to the, the Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange team, like answering all these questions, that's so cool. Um, we did have a few coming in about automated testing um, and like how that works and what sort of integration and automated testing and stuff. What's so. Uh, so automated testing was hard to do for a long time, uh, the integration test specifically, because we need whole environments. So this is something that um, especially Max, um, Samo, and Chris have been working on our, on our tooling team. 
Mm -hmm. Now what we have is a very cool setup, uh, what we've wanted for years, and we finally, again, just allocated, this is a priority, but the, the management here has been restructuring some things and just allocating actual time and people to some pain points we'd always like to solve. It's, we have great people above me doing some decision making here. So uh, you can tag a PR on our GitHub, we're on GitHub hosted, you can tag a PR and it will create a PR environment for you. You can go to a URL and test this change you have, whether it's changing styles or changing code. A PM could go in and evaluate the new behavior, right? Uh. That is a fantastic tool to have. And so by doing that, what we can do is um, have a, uh, we also use similar setups. That's in Azure and Kubernetes. It just spins up an environment and then tears it down when we don't need it any longer. So that's, mm -hmm. we are running Stack Overflow on Linux and containers, just not in production yet. Uh, okay. uh, and then for a PR uh, test, where you're running integration tests, we can spin up service containers the same way inside the VM that runs. The current pain point that I think some stuff's coming on is we just wish the runners were faster for what we're doing. Um, and I know everyone's working on that and we're looking at options. We could self-host and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but every PR runs like 30 some checks now. Samo could answer in chat there too, exactly. Um, and we run integration and uh, unit tests. Unit has been run forever. And then we deploy. I mean, it's basically gonna be notes. We're looking at front end testing, something called Mabel, I believe. Um, I'm not hmm. directly on that. Meredith's heading up our testing. She's awesome as well. Um, but yeah, we're testing is something we're spending a lot more time on because remember for a long time, Stack Overflow was free for free people with in ads, right? Now we're selling the product. So of course the oh, priority right. on testing has gotten higher. You just change, you as in design and prioritize yeah. for your current constraints. Things shift, you shift. So that's okay. where we stand. You know, I realize we've been talking about a lot of just kind of generic stuff that would apply to any site, which is kind of great that you're able to just like run on web standard stuff and do, you know, like just optimize. As far as ASP.NET dev, like I'm curious what some of, like what does your middleware chain look like? Do you have a bunch of middleware running like for monitoring and stuff or? Not a ton. Um, so the monitoring you can use, by the way, the monitoring is built into ASP.NET uh, or .NET Core effectively mm -hmm. and ASP.NET Kestrel adds a lot of metrics. Dean Ward in chat tackled this um, aspect. It's an open source library. It's called, uh, if you go to NuGet, NuGet.org, there is something called Stack Exchange Metrics. Uh, this is a this is the new version library. And this has an, uh, what it does is it collects metrics inside. These are time series based metrics and it, they can send to whatever. I think by default, it includes uh, Datadog, signal effects, and just out to a console. But the exporter for where you want to send them is actually pluggable. People could, um, people oh, could come cool. and add uh, upstream for any monitor, major, any major monitoring platform and we could stream them out. So what this gives us is, let me drag this over here. Um, so here's a dashboard that is Stack Overflow in Prod right now. So this is the past two weeks. Because we're looking at something. One of the things that's interesting right now is this is a new hardware box, this yellow line. And Dean and I cannot explain it yet. We just started looking at this. For some reason, it's doing more garbage collection than the others. However, so th you this is your live, like, this, this is, is a live. live view of your metrics. This is so cool. So this is the entire network. And you see the CPU is just like it tickles levels, like 2 3%. I don't think yeah. we can have 4% right now. And that's great. I mean, this is without the caching and everything. What's interesting to me is if you look at this, uh, this is how many concurrent requests are in Kestrel from beginning of pipe to out the pipe at any given time. And you'll see that it's like 2 to 4, max 0, 2 to 4, depending on time of day. It's just so low. And this is narrow people down the hallway. Right when this thing slows down and you start exploding, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> like something happened right here. A while right. I think this was um, this was an event that happened about two weeks ago. I can't remember exactly right now, but it went to hell. And you know, concurrent requests shot up. Exact connection pools exhausted. Yada yada. Oh, this was Redis. I think Redis did a bad mm. thing. Uh, we <laughs> there's a miscommunication and a Redis <laughs> server got rebooted um, <laughs> incorrectly. We fixed the problem. Um, so like you said, Redis rebuilds 
Redis rebuilds when needed, but it causes a spike as it does that, right? It does. And we have a secondary. Like we, we run everything HA, everything's got two power supplies, two utility feeds, two network connections, yeah. two sets of network switches, that kind of stuff. Um, but you see what we're seeing right now, this is new hardware. We're finally doing a um, refresh on hardware because what happens at Stack Overflow, typically, at least I've been here for every hardware refresh since I started, um, they let me they let me in the cage and plug in the wires. It's great. <laughs> um, now with, with COVID, now we kind of lie down. So Josh uh, is doing on the SRE team. He's great at this. Him and Tom are doing their replacements in New York this time. But uh, we replace servers, not because of resource. We run out of warranty and we run out of firmware updates. That's, okay. that's why we replace servers. Oh. Right now, we're about to replace the web tier. This yellow line you see right here, this is a canary. Yeah. This is web 09. So for some reason... This is what Dean and I got to go investigate. It's it's doing stuff, and it's got a few more errors in, in, like, here. Let's just go to this time period so that we don't. I am not a big fan of this. Yeah, the, yeah, it's uh, frustrating. Yeah. Huh? Uh, Splunk Bolt signal effects, and I have some issues with how they've <laughs> the a little bit. Um, so let me just go to like negative ten days ago and get that spike out of there, um, just so you can see a little. Easier. Mm -hmm. These are heat math graphs. The the louder the dot, the more servers are at that point. Is basically. Oh. Um, so you can see this yellow. It's also got a f not a lot, but more errors. Something's happening, and so we got to figure out. Do you know I'm going to dig into that? Him and Jason, Pun, you're going to look at it. Um, but other than that, it's it's mostly fine, right? Some of these things like garbage collection, we deal with. We're so you see the garbage collection Gen two is almost always stable. So why is the large object heap growing, right? And the reason for that at our scale is because we're multi-tenant. So a lot of apps, you run one app a box, one app a container. And the runtimes are kind of configured for this. They kind of assume that you're the only thing on the box at various unclear levels. The GCN.net at 85% system, important system memory, kicks in and does a compaction. So although you might be garbage collecting, these every time this drops, it's a build. Okay, so... Oh. This, uh, it, it's not actually using nine gigabit memory. It's using like four, but you yeah. only see that in a memory dump because it's collecting, but it's not compacting because the system has extra memory. So, I mean, that's um, what memory is for, right? right? Like I, I remember having an argument with a teammate yeah. once and they're like, at the time they were like SQL server is a memory hog. And they were looking at a SQL server machine and saying it's using way too much memory. And I'm like, that's what it's for. Like it's supposed to cache, right? <laughs> like if you don't want to use that memory for cache, then reduce your cache size. But if you mm -hmm. just throw a bunch of memory on a SQL box, its job is to use that memory. <laughs> so it's and we would like it to be a little more aggressive for most of most of my wants anyway. And mm -hmm. um uh, Mountie, who maintains the GC on .NET, she's brilliant. Um, she's added various knobs for us over time. Um, we control how much Gen Zero we use and all. Because the web servers have like um, 24 cores, 48 logical cores. They're not massive machines. This is just a typical mm -hmm. server. Um, so one of the things that we run into right now, the reason I wanted to test this, and the SRE team is, is humoring me here, we wanted to see what this garbage collection performed like with 48 gig of memory or 96 gig of memory. Between the two generations of servers, then about the count in memory banks uh, changed. So to balance it, we can no longer do 64 gig of memory for a box, which is what we used to have. You can either do 48 or 96. 96. Wait, I, I missed that. Why can't you do 64? It's just not allowed? Then just the count of memory banks has gone from two to three dims per on the oh, sockets because of generational change. So okay. With 96 gig of memory, this 85% threshold would be way higher. So you, what you would see is on the box, the process appears to be using like nine or 10 gig of memory, but that's not what we need. We need like four gig. And I wanna mm -hmm. be able to more accurately tell what we're actually using so that we could plan if we run in this environment or that environment, how much do we actually need? And this is lying to me because it's just not compacting down. And it's like, I need 10, you don't need 10, you're using 10. There's a big no, difference. You can get, there are metrics for what's in GC at the different phases, right? It's just not available here. In .NET like, 5, we are rolling out .NET 5 probably sometime soon. We're on .NET Core 3.1. So this, this graph will be okay. even lower for what it's worth. Uh, we had one bug in the .NET 5 SDK, which um, Samo reported up and they fixed. There was a Razor compilation hash collision, <laughs> which affected like 
some small percent of the customers and two of our views occasionally would have flaky build failures. We uh, just couldn't use the SDK. Other than yeah. that, we should be ready for .NET 5 um, very soon. Um, we, I've got a PR just been sitting there. It took us like two hours to port everything and check it out. So the, if you're curious, the migration is really easy. Have things improved for you over time moving to newer versions of .NET Core? Because um, I know that was some, like going from like one to two or those sorts of things were a little harder. And I know they've tried to make it easier. We're mm. able to clean up a lot more. There's not mm. there's not a big difference, but going from two to three, one was, we were at two, one and two, two when we were doing the port. Mm -hmm. Then we moved to three, one. I know I've said, I'm going to write a blog post on porting to .NET Core and I'm supposed to, this is that 2020 motivation we talked about. Yeah. I just have not, I you sit down the other day and I'm like, uh, you know, I, um, I got to say, it's frustrating because early on in this whole quarantine thing, I was like, I've got all this time. I'm not going to travel. All this stuff that I thought I couldn't do because I was traveling and busy and blah, blah, blah. I have all this time. And it's like you're saying, it's just hard. It's like you get, I don't know. There's this like. Uh, the kids are home, right? Yeah, they're, they're, there's definitely doing home that. school here. Yeah, it's yeah. just like, I'm done. Put on. Yeah. I want <laughs> For anyone that's in the same situation, there are several things on YouTube with pressure washing or car detailing or whatever that are just cathartic to watch them <laughs> clean something up and accomplish something. And that is there's great a, background. There's actually a video game on Steam with pressure washing. And you just walk around a really dirty house and garage and you just pressure wash things. So. <laughs> I'm surprised, but I shouldn't. <laughs> um, so in, in the .NET stuff, what it allows us to do is .NET keeps adding utility things uh, that let us keep cleaning up old code. So what we had to do, because we have multiple applications, we had to dual purpose. Remember, we didn't shut down the website to deploy .NET Core. It was a rolling build. We just one day uh, went to .NET Core. So you need to build some underlying code to work on both. Um, and what the largely what we did is we took a um, uh, the main library that was in Stack Overflow, pulled it out into a common library, a different project and solution, and we made it work for compile both .NET uh, Core app and full framework. We used the TFM to split, even though ASP.NET Core two would actually run the new one on top of both. We used it as a split of new and old. Uh, and mm -hmm. then we built some stuff on top of that that was new and old, and we moved an application at a time, like the API or the mobile endpoint. And then Stack Overflow was the big one at the end there. And then after that, we could go through and clear up a lot of old .NET stuff. And each .NET iteration, we can clean up more things, right? Um, and they're adding some awesome analyzers around this. Um, Stephen Tobe and team are working on analyzers that if you just go to info in Visual Studio 19 or 2022, if you're lighting mm -hmm. up .NET 5, there's more suggestions for perf where they've just made a, so for example, if you string builder dot append a quote, equal quote or whatever, any character, it'll recommend you do as a character instead of a string because they've optimized that path now. Little things that start to add up. Um, Samos uh, got, well, that's one we really should write up, the IHTML string, IHTML content. The, the problem with porting to .NET Core that most people are going to hit is the primitives have changed. ASP.NET Core is a rewrite, effectively. Mm. Your yeah. HTTP request, your HTML string, all that kind of stuff is different. So we had to write an adapter that works for both. And uh, we should absolutely probably open source that because it's really, it was like the thing we were hung on. And once we cracked that interface, we could just run. And it was really good. So, so there's the two parts to it. One is the like just updating and getting advantage the whatever perf advantage and whatever fixes. But then once you're on the newer version of a .NET Core runtime, then you can like take advantage of newer API features and stuff too. Newer APIs and when we upstream something, we, we cannot upstream a fix to .NET full framework. Not in any. Uh, it would not result in a patch that we would any longer care about by the time it came out. It's just a slow moving tied to Windows thing. It is what it is. It's the original, one of the original reasons .NET Core exists was to get away from that and be more yeah. agile and reactive. So we can go and fix things. Uh, Dean in chat, uh, you can ask him about, he's working on his sabbatical, uh, making Apple uh, AirDrop work with Windows. And he's futzing around with that. And he needed a socket option. He was able to talk to somebody, get a PR, and get it in the latest preview builds. Oh, boy, just, Whoa! I have trouble here. I just started <laughs> up my, there it is. Oh, no. Oh, my um, gosh. 
So in his stuff, uh, to make AirDrop work, he needed some socket options exposed in .NET. And uh, Dean can comment there, but I think it took a, a week or so, and now it's in the next preview. Like, that was unheard of. In, in full .NET, good luck. The compatibility bar is so high and the shipping so slow that we couldn't do much. Now, if we had to, we could pull the whole runtime into a custom compile if we wanted to, right? Having the .NET Core SDK and everything with GitHub Actions, one of the reasons we want to move, we maintain a build agent. We have to put SDKs and maintain those things. In Actions, we just say, hey, use .NET 5, see what happens. Hmm. It's a line of change in YAML. I hate YAML, but it's in YAML. Um, no YAML.com for the curious. <laughs> I have issues with YAML. Uh, okay, wait a second. I just have to share this. I don't even know if it's going to work. Uh, share entire screen. I'll turn mine off. Oh, wait. Is this... So this has been going while we were talking. It finally finished. Here's my new start menu. Here's my new, I don't know, down here. It thinks it doesn't have internet, so maybe that's a problem we'll look into. I don't know. But anyhow, it seems to be going. There's fancy stuff. Apparently got some spam. So I don't know. OK, back to you. <laughs> I just had to share. It actually did complete. Yay. Somebody <laughs> asked about um, how many blog posts are in queue. Mm. This is, I made a Trello board a while ago because I thought this was a good idea until I realized how much time I do or don't have. And uh, am I sharing that? Ooh. There we go. That I don't know if that's appearing on the screen or not. Oh, um, just a sec. It will. Boop, boop. Yeah, that. <laughs> There, yeah. there's some interest. The intent, and anyone could go vote on this, by the way. The intent was to people vote on what they would like next. I think .NET Core is the one we'd like to do. Unfortunately, it's a huge one. It mm -hmm. took a year. I mean, plus, and it wasn't even just that, right? We had to go port Dapper and Mini Profile. Oh, someone asked about Mini Profiler and Wasm and Blazor later. Um, no, there are no plans to support that because I don't know what's lacking. If you open an issue, we work through it. I'm sure we can make it work. Like I. I'm not using it enough to intelligently speak on it right now, but if you want to get that going an issue, we can totally see what it takes. Um, but the, the .NET Core one is, you know, we started with libraries. You have to get all your libraries yeah. to work on net standard or whatever first as well. So this actually started years ago with Mark and I working on, you know, protobuf net he was porting and I was helping with the builds or mini profiler or dap, or all that stuff had to come first. Then yeah. we didn't even think about doing the first layer app, you know? Um, and it took a while. And then a lot of things in there are deep dives. How does buffering work? How does, like if, you, if you're if you reading mm -hmm. a body and you seeked back in the stream, that doesn't work anymore. Because we right. it's out of the buffer in .NET Core. You need to change how that works, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Did you have much involved with changing to like session, session state? I'm imagining you didn't use that too <laughs> those much. Are, those are dirty words. Uh, I know, I know. We don't use session state at our, our, our state is very um, thin. You have an account session, which goes across the network. Um, so you can view different domains and on your top bar, even if you don't have a user on the site, your top bar keeps working. You'll notice that. So we have an account session. And other than that, we load your user every page, that kind of stuff, right? That's one of those. We just fetch a lot of stuff every page load and we don't cache it. And that prevents a lot of race conditions too, right? You race against cash and you're going to have a bad time as well. Okay. Uh, someone was asking if, if I could share the Trello. So I'm going to share the link to that if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. I already put it in chat there. So someone can. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, wow. So there's a lot of stuff going on. We've got a front team, a front end team working on. And if one of the other cool designs that you might want to check out is if you go to stackoverflow.design, and I'll pop this in chat. This is a. Um, Aaron is working on our front end, um, and now there's, he's got some backup. We, we did some hiring, and so um, Dan's working on it now. I think Ben's moved over. Uh, we open source the front. This is exactly the style sheets and all that run on Stack Overflow. We do some customization beyond this, but the base components of a header should always look like this, and yada, yada, kind of like a bootstrappy type of thing. It's an atomic-based yeah. library. This is what we use so devs can very quickly get something, and then we can tweak it in design phase. Um, so we're trying to open source more of that, although it's not super well known um, necessarily. Mm. There are some other projects besides Redis, Spinny Profiler, Dapper, even the front end we're starting to. So if that's wow. useful for somebody, it's very handy um, for us. 
Wow. Yeah, this is great. I love the um, the way that your team works in the open. Like there's they're sharing information like this, but then there's also just being public <clears throat> on Twitter and, you know, out in the community just answering questions, which is really cool. And so. people, I wish people would share their failures more often. We've we've boned many things. Uh, this morning, something happened and the wrong low balancer rebooted and a HA didn't, a myriad of things led to a, a outage for a very short period this morning. It was um, probably my fault, honestly, because I had several computer problems. And someone <laughs> might've upgraded the load balancer to Windows 11. <laughs> um, so that kind of stuff is, uh, you know, I wish because people have imposter syndrome. Like I do. I don't think I should be here um, or anywhere else. Right. People were <laughs> like, and if I share with you a failure, a, the only thing that can happen is if it were like, Hey, you suck, but that never happens. I've never gotten that feedback. Um, yeah. You know, they say, Hey, here's how we did it better. Here's how we improved. Okay. I'll learn something. Or someone else just reads this and goes like, Ooh, I won't do that. Great. The whole mission has been improve the dev experience, whether that be in software or us testing something before you get a hold of it to break it. Um, that's very much still core mission here. And I think all the, especially the the older the devs get here, the more that gets ingrained. Um, I mean, it's the whole kind of like unit testing and just working in public and like all the fail fast, right? Get good at recovering yeah. from a failure is much better than like, not like being scared to share or like not wanting to know or whatever. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, I, so one interesting question, we should wrap up pretty soon, but one interesting <laughs> question here, uh, do you use any AI? Oh, um, like I, I'm thinking, I don't know what the definition of AI is. Hey, there's a space in stack overflow, public service announcement. Everyone put a space. This is the hill I'm going to die on. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I just sent out a reminder tweet once a year. Um, the logo didn't do us any favors for like 10 years there. So uh, we don't use, I don't know what people consider AI. I considered a bunch of if statements. So I'm a little weird on the definition, but we do run all comments through something. Um, Kevin Montrose and Jason Punyon largely worked on something called the unfriendly robot. And all comments on Stack Overflow go into this. And if we detect rude or abusive behavior, that's something we really want to curb. There is effort going into this. We try and flag those. And that's um, a large training set and GPU-based um, implementation. In that's actually running in Azure on a because we didn't have GPUs in data center uh, as a service. And so every time it constantly we're processing comments as they come in and flagging them appropriately for mods. And that's been very effective at getting a lot of rude stuff out. That's really the only AI I get. It's, it's a machine learning data set that does some stuff. I don't know what people call AI, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's tricky. Well, yeah, I mean, but yeah, that is useful to detect a bad behavior. And, and that is an interesting thing. I ran into a case too. We actually were using StreamYard for hosting this now, which is nice because like, I'm able to switch computers and not worry about any kind of, mm -hmm. like it just works, you know, it's my computer, I could lose my internet and the show would keep going. But for a bit, we actually did have an OBS hosted, uh, like a box hosted in Azure with GPU acceleration mm -hmm. turned on, which was pretty neat to be able to do that. So. It's it's great. I'm still, I'm just trying to buy a, my, my new machines over here inside of sight, but um, I, I can't find a GPU anywhere. <laughs> uh, that's a problem too. Um, well, okay, this was amazing. I just asked you a ton of questions. I, I think from the chat, people thought it was interesting and they also got their questions answered um, awesome. from the team, which is cool. We love Q&A. I'd be happy to do something like this again, if you would like to, like, and if yeah, people sure. have questions or if there's things that you like, for instance, as you go through a blog post or an area and you're like, hey, I'd like to talk more about how we do metrics and analytics or whatever, you know, we could go deep into something. So. I think everyone here is a very terrible judge of like what other people find interesting to like, we do caching a certain way and we're like, that's that's just Tuesday. That's what, how it's always worked. <laughs> I don't know what's interesting. So it, really feedback from people asking you what is interesting is huge. That's why I made the blog post thing because I really don't know what to talk about. Um, some of the stuff we don't know that it's abnormal because we just built it before the framework did or whatever for 20 different reasons. We just haven't changed this in eight years. So we're like, whatever, but it's super interesting to people and maybe it would save them time. Um, so yeah, any, anything that would, uh, be of interest to people focus on that. Yeah. 
Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again to the team for answering questions. Thanks so much for your time, Nick. This has been amazing. So All right. thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been fun watching Stack Overflow grow over time too, and and watching like the you know the community, and it's it's funny from like I'm I'm a Stack Overflow ID five still, <laughs> and it's like it. been playing with it since the beginning, and now it's neat. I have a daughter studying C plus plus, bless her heart, and uh, it, yeah. she's like I know, and she well it was a requirement, but she's oh, like okay. oh. she's. Uh, and getting her questions answered on Stack Overflow. And it's so cool to see the whole thing, like just the, the programming community helping each other there, so. When I, I, we didn't meet back then, but like when uh, Mix 11 was the first one of the meetups I went to with the crew and there's, I think Hanselman had uh, Sam Safran, um, uh, Balfa or Benjamin Dumke Van Dehe and yep. uh, Kevin Montrose on. Um, and you can see like it was 30 million hits a day and across nine web servers. Now we're doing, you know, 500 million plus it's a day on nine web servers. And it, it's just fun. It's fun to look back and like everything's just kind of flatline. And yeah, wow. I love it. Amazing. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. This is amazing. And I, I would like to get you back on sometime. So absolutely. All right. Thanks a bunch.